29. Typology and Eschatology Typology has an essential relation to eschatology, the doctrine of the last things. Before developing briefly that relationship, it is best to understand what typology is. Our concern here is not with the three kinds of typology, but with typology itself. To begin on a very necessary and elementary level, typology asserts a common meaning and relationship. When our daughter Sharon was about twenty, she went to Kingsburg to visit her grandmother. As she was walking from the bus station to her grandmother's home, a man whom she had never seen before stopped, offered her a ride and said, I'm not a stranger. You are obviously a Rashtuni, and we are related, so I know who you are. Albert's father and my father, Sharon's grandfather, were first cousins. Without knowing about Sharon or her coming, he had recognised her, and she herself then recognised the common appearance, although she is blonde and he somewhat dark of skin and hair. They shared a common bloodline, a certain characteristic manner and a sense of recognition. This has a resemblance to typology. The reality of typology is that God is the creator of heaven and earth and of all things therein. As the creator, he gives his meaning to all things so that history and the universe have a common pattern. That pattern means that a discernible thread and strand of meaning govern every moment of time and every atom of creation. At certain points, one or another strong element in that pattern surfaces plainly and decisively. At all times, it is present and in the context of things. Thus, to cite a dominant pattern or type, Adam is the first man and head of the original and fallen humanity, whereas Jesus Christ is the second or last Adam and the head of the new and redeemed humanity. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 to 23 and verses 45 to 49. In the world of Darwin, there can be no typology because accident and chance determine all things. If there is a pattern, it is accidental, not purposive. Hence, the rise of evolutionary thinking has undermined the interest in and development of the meaning of biblical typology. Typology presupposes creationism and predestination. It declares that a common and predetermined purpose governs directs and informs every fact of history. For this reason, typology and prophecy are also interrelated. Fairbairn said of typology, The typical is not properly a different or higher sense, but a different or higher application of the same sense. The type binds God's creation together. It points forward to the consummation of God's plan and hence, it is eschatological. It sees past history as essentially tied to the present and to the future, and hence prophetic. Types are thus set in God's creative acts and his predestinating counsel. It is the typological nature of creation which makes science and historiography possible. Scientific knowledge would be impossible if the universe of facts were unrelated and meaningless. It is the common factor in data which makes science possible, and the fact of developments which is basic to history. In the strictly theological sense, the type is that which binds the Old and New Testaments together, so that we have apparent both a common purpose and a development in that purpose. Turning again to Fairbairn. It is held, first, that in the character, action, or institution which is denominated the type, there must be a resemblance in form or spirit to what answers to it under the gospel. And secondly, that it must not be any character, action, or institution occurring in the Old Testament scripture, but such only as had their ordination of God 
and were designed by him to foreshadow and prepare for the better things of the gospel. The type is thus not a symbol. The eagle is a symbol of America and the bear of Russia, but there is no essential link between an eagle and the United States and a bear and the Russian Empire. The connection is arbitrary and man-made, whereas there is an essential relationship between Adam and Christ. It is God-ordained, and it is necessary to an understanding of man, history, and salvation. It is this essential nature of typology which gives it power. It is where men, first, recognize the importance of typology, and, second, see its relationship to eschatology, that they begin to remake history in terms of God's pattern. Lawrence, in studying the use of typology by American Puritans, titled his chapter, The Shaping of the Future, Eschatological Symbolism in Old and New England During the Seventeenth Century. The Edwardians became post-millennialists, and they saw an historical sequence in the types which led them to work for Christ's reign in every realm. According to Lawrence, like modern charismatic and, quote, born-again, end quote, Christian groups, Edwards and the New Lights regarded man's life after rebirth to be an instrument of the Spirit. The conviction that their present lives prophesied future fulfillments was the deepest impulse of the New Light movement. New Lights read their Bibles to understand what future blessings God had revealed in the words and lives of his chosen peoples. Let us now examine an example of the link between typology and eschatology. Priesthood is a biblical fact, and, like kingship, has an important place in typology. First, there is an identification of the priestly and the kingly in Melchizedek, who is seen by David in Psalm 110 as God's right-hand man. Not Melchizedek personally, but a priest-king, after the order of Melchizedek. That is, one who owes his rank and office not to descent by blood, but to God's appointment. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 28. Second, in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 to 13, the priestly and royal person is also God's suffering servant, making atonement for our sins. Third, the Davidic princely line shall bring forth a priestly ruler, according to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 21. Fourth, Zechariah chapter 6 portrays this coming priest king on the throne. Fifth, Isaiah chapter 66 verse 21 prophesies an international priesthood made up of the faithful brethren out of all nations. Sixth, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, we are told that all believers have been made kings and priests by Jesus Christ. Unto God and his Father, This typological sequence is set in the context of many other sequences, all interrelated to this one. The Adam-Christ relationship is the central one, of course. Adam failed to be God's priestly king and sought to exercise these offices in terms of himself as his own God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 All the sons of Adam have sought a like independent jurisdiction and a like status as their own gods. Jesus Christ, as the true man, as well as truly God, is the new Adam, faithful to his office. He has, according to John, washed us from our sins in his own blood, loosed us thereby from sin and death, and has thereby made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, To him be the glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Thus, the type here begins with man, Adam, is debased by him, 
but is then re-established in its truth, justice and holiness by Christ. And then it is made again the calling of the now regenerate sons of Adam who are members of Jesus Christ. To cite another example of typology, Christ is seen as the greater Moses, as the ultimate lawgiver. The Sermon on the Mount gives a deliberate completion to Moses' revelation on the Mount Sinai. Moses said, Thus saith the Lord. But Jesus said, I say unto you. When the woman at the well spoke to Jesus, she probably, if not certainly, in saying, I know that Messiah cometh. John chapter 4 verse 25. Messiah is the actual word in the Greek text. Said, I know that the Taheb cometh. Because, as Birch pointed out, the Taheb, which is the name for the Samaritan anointed one, is a bringer in of the law. That is also the basal idea in the Hebrew conception of the Messiah. Both connotes another Moses. We have found that the Amen name is borne by him who surpasses Moses and who brings in the new law. Jesus explained to one woman, I that speak unto thee am he. Again, we see typology bring to focus God's purpose. The law is given by God through Moses to a lawless generation. Christ comes as the true and faithful Adam to keep the law perfectly and to create a righteous and law-keeping, that is, covenant-keeping humanity. Calvin said, The law is a silent magistrate, and a magistrate a speaking law. We can, in terms of typology, extend this to say that covenant man must be a speaking law and a living witness of grace, mercy, peace and justice. As we have seen, it is God's creation of all things which links all things to his purpose. In the life of man, there must be a moral link, the willingness to say in Christ and with Christ, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. To be in Christ is to be in his typological purpose. 